Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my Code to Care video series where we talk about healthcare and AI. I'm here with my special guest, Jay Nakashima. Uh, Jay is president of eHealth Exchange. Welcome, Jay. Country. But I wanted to focus on um, what, how does interoperability matter for AI? Yeah. And, and essentially, how does data matter for AI? Because we just generally think of AI as wonderful, magical, chat GPT-ish, things like that. But, but does data matter? Does interoperability matter? Is there, is there some connection here that, that we wanted to uh, um, uh, talk through here in the yeah, field? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what, what's, your, what's your perspective? Yeah, so, you know, um, data definitely matters. Uh, you know, providers aren't just moving data around uh, uh, for the sake of it. You know, their real goal is to, um, is to uh, you know, get some intelligence out of the data. And, you know, eHealth Exchange moves about 25 billion transactions annually. Amazing. If, yeah, if you get the InterSystems platform. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the providers are starting to accrue a little bit of, of, of information, and they're having trouble synthesizing that okay. amount of data. Sure, yeah. sure, sure, sure. So, you know, if you take a complex uh, uh, patient, a patient with high acuity, and you are crazy enough to print out their medical record, yep. Yep. you can yep. easily get to 300, 600 really. pages, yeah, yeah. and yeah. no one's going to have the time to read through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for one of our one of our customers, we calculated the average size of a chart. Now, this is a customer that's done medical records for decades. Yeah. Now, there aren't that many, so but I, I'm not going to necessarily list their name. The, the chart printed out. The average chart was 7,600 pages. Ouch! And uh, we we actually piled the paper. It's about this 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 size. Uh, just just off the shelf paper. We didn't actually print it. Um, uh, but any rate, yeah, we you could imagine us getting information rich. Or, or data rich, information poor, in a sense, meaning we have these big charts, but what can we do with them? AI seems like a potential, but it doesn't happen for free. Correct. Yeah. So, what I was thinking in terms of data and AI, I'd be interested in your perspective, is kind of there's tabular AI, actually, which is um, most people call ML, kind of traditional ML these days. And then there's generative AI. And I think that from my perspective, you know, machine learning. I think obviously needs good data because what you're doing in machine learning is you're training a model on uh, readmission, identifying readmissions or no-show appointments or, uh, you know, chance of getting sepsis or sure. things like that. So you're predicting something by pattern matching everything else. You know, here's information about the patient or the appointments or whatever. And so you you need to train a model based on your data. And if you're not bringing the data together and normalizing it, cleaning it, that sort of thing, you're not going to have a model that works and that is accurate and useful. Right. Would you say? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And I think it's more than just, um, you know, normalizing codes, let's say. But like an easy one that people forget is like patient matching. You know, like you can bring your data together, but if you don't match the two patients, like a lot of these models look for comorbidities, like what else is wrong with these patients? And if, you know, their diabetes is in one one system and another system has their past history of heart disease, then it's not pulling that together and it's not going to be accurate either. That's right. So bringing the data together, but really integrating it under the same patients, under normalized codes, that sort of thing, really unlocks the ability for AI to do an accurate job. Yeah, and it helps you to trust the data. Yeah, 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 true, true. Now, in generative AI, I think, is similar but different. Like, if you think of generative AI as at least one experience, might be a chat user experience. Clinician is asking questions about summarize his patient chart or that, that kind of thing. These large language models don't work by themselves. You know, they really draw upon the medical records, and the information that you feed it as part of your application. So if your data is scattered everywhere, if it's not matched to the right patient, you're going to be feeding the LLM, you know, a subset of information. It's not going to be answering questions accurately. Correct. Would you say? Yeah, yeah. correct. In fact, I was on, uh, there's a funny story about a panel I was on, and uh, there they were implementing um Gen AI to summarize a patient visit before the patient left the building. 
uh, and it was doing a horrible job. It wasn't saying anything about the patient visit, but it turned out that um, it didn't have access to notes that weren't signed yet. Oh, ouch. And so the physician hadn't signed the notes, so they weren't being sent to the model. So it was just talking about the past and really wasn't representing, you know, what was happening now. Right. So Gen AI, I think, is similar similar to ML in that there's there's magic of AI, but the magic is a little bit um, empty without providing it data, providing it context for it to really work work its magic. Right. Yeah. Good. Do you guys have any AI projects? No, we don't. Right or wrong, eHealth Exchange decided years ago when we were founded as a government initiative, the National Health Information Network, that we would just serve as a simple pass-through. Uh-huh. Okay. So data goes in our system, and yeah, within yeah. a split second, we okay. delete it. Okay. But we're very hopeful that the providers who consume the data yeah. are using AI to help them process it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, what I tell customers about an AI strategy is you got to think through that data strategy. Yeah. And part of thinking that, that through that strategy and really making it happen is leveraging organizations like yourself right. to get that broad view of the data for the patient to bring that together for their projects. Yeah. So One thing we do do, which is I think is immensely helpful, is we require that all of our participants, all of our providers, payers, whatever, federal agencies, we make them prove that the data they exchange adheres to national standards. Great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we can't do a whole lot with um, with unstructured documents. So, you know, uh, yep. discharge notes yep. or whatever, progress notes. But we do require that, hey, if you're going to send um, a medication that you represent it with an RX norm code, mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. going to send a lab Good. result. That's it's got to be codified. That's great. That's great. So you take an active role in supporting or requiring normalized data. Yes. Basically. Yeah, that, that really helps kind of recipients, users of your data to, to implement these AI models, right. I would say. Okay, great. Great. Well, good to chat. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, okay. Hope that was interesting. Thanks, everyone. And until next time. Bye.